Let's pray together. Lord, once again, as we come to your scripture, uh, as we come to this crucial point in Jesus' ministry, as we learn more about uh, Jesus, his disciples, and your will for our lives as well, we ask that the words of my mouth, the meditations, the thoughts of all of our hearts and minds together would be pleasing and acceptable, Lord, in your sight. For, Lord, you're our rock, you're our redeemer. One of my favorite historical characters is a Methodist preacher named Peter Cartwright. Peter Cartwright was a Methodist pastor back in the middle of the 1800s. And he was a well-known, not only Methodist preacher, but politician. In his lifetime, he baptized over 12,000 people. Um, he was a courageous um, pastor, and he was famous for his preaching being powerful and uncompromising. He would just lay it out there straight. And so this is the middle of the 1800s, and he had a church, a Methodist church, and one day found out that the coming Sunday, the President of the United States, Andrew Jackson, was going to come to his church. Now, Andrew Jackson was President of the United States from 1829 to 1937. He was known by a lot of names, old rough and ready, so Andrew Jackson was going to come to Peter Cartwright's church. And when they found out that the President of the United States was coming to Cartwright's church, the elders of the church, the leaders of the church, pulled Peter Cartwright aside and they went, please, Peter, please try not to offend the President. <laughs> now that the President of the United States is going to be in church this morning, please, please try not to offend him. Try not to say anything that's going to offend the President. So, Sunday morning came, Andrew Jackson, the president's in the congregation, Cartwright gets up to speak, and here are the very first things that Peter Cartwright said. He said, I understand that President Andrew Jackson is here this morning, and I have been requested to be very guarded in my remarks. Let me say this, Andrew Jackson will go to hell if he does not repent of his sins. So at the end of the service, Peter Cartwright was standing at the back of the church. People were filing out, and the President of the United States came up to him. Andrew Jackson came up to Peter Cartwright. He looked him straight in the eye, and the President said, Sir, if I had a regiment of men like you, I could conquer the world. Because President Jackson appreciated Peter Cartwright's boldness. He appreciated his boldness. Peter Cartwright was bold. So he's one of my favorite historical preachers. If there's one thing that when people ask if they can pray for me, people tell me they're praying for me, often what I ask for, please pray for me to be bold. Pray for me to be bold, especially this year especially over the next six or seven months. I need your prayers, maybe more than ever, and I need one of those prayers for me to be bold. Now, boldness was a quality that Peter Cartwright had. It's also a quality we see in another preacher named Peter, the, the original Peter, Peter the disciple. And that's what we see in the passage today. Now, I've touched on this passage already a couple of times and referred to this passage, and it's a fairly familiar passage where Jesus um, gathers the disciples together. If you remember, this is really a crucial time because after really three years of ministry, Jesus took his disciples away from the crowds, away really from Jewish territory to a more Gentile part of Palestine, Caesarea Philippi. It was a place where there was a pagan temple to the god Pan. Um, there's a cave there that was historically the entranceway to Hades, the place of the dead. When some of us went to Israel a few years ago, we visited Caesarea Philippi. We saw the cave that was considered to be the gateway to Hades. That's where Jesus gathers these disciples for sort of a retreat, a last time together before the final leg of his ministry. And he gathers them and he asks them two questions. He asks them an easy question and a hard question. 
The first question was the easy question. What are people saying about me? What are people saying about my identity? Who do people say that I am? And they say, oh, well, there's all kinds of theories out there about you. Some think that you're Elijah, come back. Some think that you're Jeremiah or one of the other Old Testament prophets. Some even think you're John the Baptist, come back to life. Because who do people say that I am? What are people saying is a very easy question. It's a very easy question today. What are people saying? Oh, you can answer that easily. Well, I heard this one guy... Uh, this one guy on TV was spouting these crazy theories. Oh, this one person on Facebook, they said all this nutty stuff. I, can you believe it? And all these other people were arguing with them. And I heard this guy on the radio say some strange things. Or My little neighbor lady, she's a little off. and She's got some strange ideas. Answering the question, what are people saying, is very easy. It's, it's, there's no risk. Oh, this person says this, this person says that. There's no risk to saying all the odd things that other people are saying. That's an easy question. We can repeat other people's crazy things all day long. The hard question is, what do you believe? What is your opinion? What do you think? What do you believe? That's a little more challenging question. To put your belief, your opinion, your thoughts out there for everyone else to see and hear, for them to criticize and judge or laugh at or agree with and applaud or whatever and say, I believe this, I think this. And you put that out there. And then you wait to see if people are going to respond favorably or, or not. And Peter, Peter puts it out there. After they had a good laugh about John the Baptist and you were the same guy, we've seen you two together, uh, crazy people. After they laughed and chuckled at other people's crazy ideas, when Jesus says, well, what about you? What are you thinking? Who do you say I am? Peter? Peter steps up. Peter puts it out there. He says, you're the Messiah. And he doubles down. Not just the Messiah. He says, you're the Son of God. And that's a pretty bold statement because Jesus had never used the word Messiah or Christ before, referring to himself. He called himself the Son of Man, a very ambiguous sort of title. He'd never used the M word, Messiah, talking about himself. But that's what Simon Peter steps up and says, you're the Messiah, you're the Son of God. And that, there's a risk in that because Jesus could have said, Peter, what do you mean? That's blasphemy. Or he could say, oh, Peter, you're way off. There was some risk in saying, this is who you are. You're the Messiah. But Jesus, as we know, responds this way. We read Matthew 16. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. This wasn't revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my Father in heaven. I'll tell you, you're Peter, Petros. And on this rock, Petra, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome. Peter hits a home run because he spoke out with boldness. Now, this is not the first time we see this in Peter. That's, that's Peter's characteristic. Peter tended to speak first and think later. He tended to act first and think later. He was very bold. And we see this all different places in Peter's life. A couple of chapters earlier, in chapter 14 of Matthew, remember Jesus, the feeding of the 5,000? Jesus... People have been teaching people all day long. They got hungry. They, there was no, you know, quickie mark nearby, no restaurants, nothing like that. They were hungry. They took one little boy's sack lunch and fed 5,000 people. And then Jesus said, we got to go. And he tells the disciples, get in the boat and cross over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. The, really a lake, Lake Gennesaret, the Sea of Galilee. But he didn't go with him. He needed prayer time with his father. So he goes to pray and he says, you guys cross over to the other side of the lake. And they're doing it late at night. They're crossing over. When Jesus decides he's finished with his prayer time, he's going to join his brothers, going to join the disciples. And so he comes to the boat, walking on the water. And, you know, it's dark, maybe moonlight, not, not a lot of light. They see this 
figure coming towards them, and they are scared out of their minds. They are, they're terrified. They think it's a, a ghost. They're screaming. And Jesus calms them. He says this, Matthew 14, 27. Jesus said to them, Take courage, it's I, don't be afraid. It's me, guys. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. If it's really you, then tell me to walk on water too. And Jesus was like, okay, come on. And so Peter steps out of the boat, which is a bold move. That's a bold move to step out of the boat and start walking towards Jesus. But then he kind of starts to look around and sees the waves and the wind and sees everything, looks down and is like, I can't do this. <laughs> this is impossible. It, nobody can walk on water. It, it always reminds me, this is how my mind works, it reminds me of the old Roadrunner cartoons and um, Wile E. Coyote is chasing the Roadrunner and the Roadrunner goes off, you know, zips down and he runs out off the cliff and he's running and he's walking on air until he looks down and realizes, I can't do this. And then he drops, you know. That, that, that's cartoon physics though. Um, and, you know, in cartoon physics, you don't fall until you realize you're walking on air. But Peter is walking on water, and he looks around, and he says, This is impossible. I can't do this. And he starts to sink. And Jesus has to pull him up. But it shows Peter's boldness. Now, his boldness doesn't always turn out well. At that same retreat where he hit the home run, You're the Messiah. You're the Son of God. boy, Peter. That very same retreat... Later on, we're not sure if it was minutes or hours later, but that same place where Jesus says, yes, I'm going to call you the rock. You got it, Peter. You're right. That same retreat later on, Jesus, once the proclamation has been made, yes, he is the Messiah. Yes, he is the Son of God. He starts to tell very frankly, all right, we're heading to Jerusalem. I'm going to be arrested when I get there, when we get there. I'll be arrested. I'll be taken into custody, I'll be mistreated, and I'll be killed. He starts telling them this very serious news about how he is going to die. And once again, bold Peter steps up. Bold Peter steps up and says this. He says in 1622, Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord! This shall never happen to you. Not on my watch. No way that's ever going to happen to the Messiah. You're the king. You're going to take control of Israel. You're going to get rid of these Romans. You're the king. That's never going to happen. That's not happening, Lord. And he's waiting for Jesus to go, Yeah, I had you go in there, didn't I, Peter? You're right. That's not going to happen to me. Right again, Peter. No. No, Jesus doesn't praise him there. He doesn't say, thanks for stepping up for me, Peter. He says, get behind me, Satan. Satan. Now, Satan doesn't mean the devil. Satan is a word that means adversary, enemy. He says, Peter, everything you're saying is counter to God's plan. I've just laid out for you what has to happen. You're thinking from a human perspective. I'm thinking and talking about God's perspective. So the first time Peter takes a big swing, you're the Messiah. Boom, home run. Second time he takes a big swing, that's not going to happen to you. Strike out. But both times, he takes big swings. Because Peter's bold. Now, even though he strikes out with that second proclamation at Caesarea Philippi, that doesn't change his essential character of boldness. When they get to Jerusalem, sure enough, Jesus is betrayed. Jesus is arrested. He's, they're there in the garden, and here come guards. Judas betrays him with a kiss. Here come guards to take him into custody. And Peter, it's time for action. John 18.10, they're about to arrest Jesus. Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. Peter's like, uh-uh, you're not taking Jesus. He's going to fight. 
And Jesus says, no, that's not the way we do things. That's not our way. We're not going to live by the sword. If you live by the sword, you die by the sword. No, no, Peter. Put away, put away the sword. And he heals the servant's ear. And he's taken into custody. And what began as a bad night becomes the worst night of his life. Because everybody, when they arrest Jesus, all the disciples flee and abandon him. But Peter follows from a distance to see what's going to happen to Jesus. And they take Jesus to the house of the high priest, Caiaphas. And they begin this mockery of a trial in the middle of the night. They're slapping Jesus. They're spitting on him. They're calling him a blasphemer and a false prophet and a false messiah. And as they're hurling insult to Jesus, Peter is out in the courtyard waiting to see what's going to happen. When he gets recognized by someone who says, hey, you, you were with Jesus. You're one of his followers, aren't you? No, I think you're mistaken. That, that wasn't me. Yeah, I, I know it's you. You have that Galilean accent. You were one of the men who was with Jesus. I told you it's not me. Yeah, you really, I know, you're one of those people who was with Jesus. You're a Jesus follower. And Peter begins to curse and swear, no, I don't know that man. I don't know this Jesus. And he runs off, weeping. The bold Peter of that time, well, he caves that time. But it's not the end, of course. We know on Sunday, when the women come back from the tomb with the story of the tomb being open and, and Jesus not being there and Jesus even appearing to them, Peter runs to, the tent, runs to the tomb and sees it empty. And that night, Jesus himself appears to them. We know the rest of that story, how eventually Peter takes a leadership role among the disciples, how on the day of Pentecost, Peter stands up, the fisherman stands up and preaches. How not long after that, he and John are going into the temple to pray, and there's a beggar by the door, and the beggar is not able to walk, hasn't walked for years, wants an offering, wants alms, and Peter says, I don't have any gold or silver, but let me give you this, stand up in the name of Jesus. And he does. And a crowd gathers to see the lame man walk, and Peter takes the opportunity to preach again, and he and John get arrested for their trouble. And are hauled before the Sanhedrin, the very same group that condemned Jesus to death, the very same group that sent Jesus to Pilate. And they say, who told you you could do this? Who told you you could heal somebody? And it's funny, who told you you could talk about this Jesus? We got rid of him. And they order Peter and John not to speak about Jesus ever again. Don't let us hear you mention that Jesus ever again. And Peter and John say, well, you're ordering us not to talk about Jesus. Should we obey you or God? Should we follow what you say or should we follow what God says? And the Sanhedrin, it says, is amazed by their courage standing up. In fact, it says this, Acts 4.13. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness, there's that word, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. For they could see they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. They were amazed at their boldness. I need boldness every day. I ask that you'd pray for me to be bold. Now, in our culture that is often so toxic, I don't want anybody to confuse boldness with rudeness. You know, the Internet is full of people who probably think they're bold, spouting their opinions and criticizing others in the most offensive way possible from the safety of a keyboard or a smartphone anonymously hurling rocks and stones and telling people that they're stupid or ugly or fat or whatever. People who think they're being bold and they're just being rude and mean. When I talk about boldness, I'm not talking about being a troll. 
I'm not talking about rudeness. You know, every good quality can turn into a bad quality. Smart people can become condescending people. Funny people can become annoying people. Compassionate people can become doormats. Let people walk all over them. Tough people can become bullies. And some people who think they're bold and strong are really offensive and intrusive and mean. So boldness doesn't mean intrusive and mean. It doesn't mean being a troll. So what does boldness mean in the Bible? What does it mean to be bold? Well, Paul, when he was in jail for following Jesus, when, Peter, when, when Paul's in prison for following Jesus, he writes a letter to his young apprentice, Timothy, and he says this in 2 Timothy 1, 7 and 8. For the spirit God gave us doesn't make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Notice when he talks about being bold, he doesn't talk about being rude or abrasive. He talks about power, love, and self-discipline. We're bold, but we are bold in love. <laughs> we're bold, but we're self-disciplined about our words and our deeds and our actions. We're bold because the Spirit of God gives us the power to testify about Jesus, to share the good news about Jesus. Matter of fact, in another letter, Paul says this in 2 Corinthians. He says, talk about the hope we have in Christ. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Since we have such a hope, we're very bold. <clears throat> bold in sharing good news. <laughs> you know, we're not asked to go share bad news. We're not asked to go and share doom and gloom, we're asked to share the gospel, which is good news. Hope, love, peace, joy. We're called upon to share hope. The hope that comes in Christ. It says that when the Sanhedrin saw Peter and John and how they wouldn't back down, how Peter and John said, well, we're going to follow God instead of you. How, how they saw, when they saw Peter and John, they saw these are, these are not educated men. These are not priests or Pharisees. These are not men who spent their life studying the scriptures. These are a couple of fishermen. These are common blue-collar guys. And they saw their courage. It says they were amazed at their boldness, and they recognized them as having been with Jesus. We can tell these men have been with Jesus. Can people tell you've been with Jesus? Can people tell you've been with Jesus? Are you afraid to talk about him? Are you willing to share about him? You know, I, you know, I like statistics, or at least I don't certainly like, like the statistics, but I'm... I'm always reading stats, and, and a couple of weeks ago on Confirmation Sunday, I, I shared a pretty depressing statistic. I talked about when I was first ordained back in 1986, over 90% of Americans claimed Christianity. Now, it's down to 64%. The 64% of Americans now identify as Christian, down from the 90s, over 90% 30, 40 years ago. And the number of people who say they have no religion went from single digit to now 30% of people in America, in America say they have no religion. None. You know, any. So I, I mentioned that statistic. Here's a couple of other statistics, though, that are a little more, you have to dig deep into these. Here's one. Half of Americans, 51% you know, of Americans, say they're curious as to why some people are so devoted to their faith including 60% of those people who say they have no religion. 60% of the people who say they have no religion are curious, why do some people have so much faith? 60% of the people who have no faith, no religion, no belief in God, 60% of those unaffiliated people are curious, why are some people so devoted to their faith? 
But here's the flip of that statistic. 60% of Americans say many of their friends who claim to be Christians rarely talk about their faith. 52% of those people who say they have no religion say they have Christian friends, but they never talk about it or rarely mention their faith. So picture a circle of friends, picture a circle of people. Some in the group identify as Christian, some say they have no religion, no faith, no God. And over half of the people who say they have no religion or faith say, yeah, I know Christian people, they're friends of mine, but they never, they never talk about it. They never share about it. They never mention this Jesus fellow. So that's where being timid or being bold comes into play. You might say, why is that so? Why were the disciples so on fire? They couldn't wait to tell people about Jesus. And why are so many followers of Jesus today so hesitant to talk about him? So hesitant to share their faith? And I know one reason is, well, because I've seen other people do it so poorly. <laughs> I've seen other people do such a bad job of it. And yes, we know there are people who have done a really poor job of it. People who have done it by pointing fingers and telling people they're all going to hell and shouting and screaming and, and being closed-minded and bigoted. and uh, you know, every, we, we can point to plenty of examples of so-called Christians who've done a horrible job of trying to share the good news and make it sound like it's bad news. I don't think God is asking any of us to get up on a soapbox on a street corner and start yelling at people. I don't think that's, one, effective, and I, I just think it's not the way to share Jesus. I think what is the way to share Jesus is to say, this is what God has done for me. This is what Jesus has done for me, you know? Because nobody can really argue with that. <laughs> you know, if you start spouting, well, I think in the book of Revelation, this means this and this means this, people can go, well, I don't believe that at all. But if you say, well, this is what God has done for me, they, you can, they can't say, no, he didn't. It's your testimony. Nobody can say, if you claim and say, this is what Jesus means to me, this is what God has done for me, no one can say, well, that, no, that's not true. Yeah, it is true, because it's what God has done for me. And that's something we can all do. And I believe God doesn't just prompt us when to talk. I, I believe God helps us to know the timing of things. Because <laughs> there's a time to share and there's a time not to. You know, uh, like anything else, you've got to practice a little bit. You've got to be smart about it. There, there's a time, you know, <laughs> there's a time and a way to share your faith. If you're on an airplane with a complete stranger and the first thing you say to them is, do you, do you know Jesus? I mean, <laughs> they're gonna, can I have another seat, please? Um, you know, there's a time and a way to do these things because people really don't care what you know until they know that you care. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. You have to have a relationship before you have the privilege of sharing your faith. But all through the scripture, we're called <laughs> to share the good news, to share Jesus, and to be bold. Because remember, this verse this verse about boldness from 2 Corinthians 3.12. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Since we have such a hope, we're very bold. Let's pray. Lord, we, we need your spirit to embolden us, to give us courage. Lord, we can... We can barely conceive of, of people across the centuries who have stood up for Christ and have been imprisoned, tortured, burned at the stake, thrown to the lions. And yet they were bold in their proclamation of faith. And sometimes, Lord, we can't even muster up the courage or the boldness to, to say a word about you to people that we love and trust. Uh, Lord, give us a holy boldness. Help us to be always wrapping our boldness in love. 
help us to always wrap that boldness in love. We pray in your name.